Hey everyone, this is Vanessa Chase. Welcome to our lunchtime Google Hangout on nonprofit storytelling. Thank you so much for bearing with me here for a few minutes while I had some technical problems. Uh, always the way, isn't it? <laughs> so really glad you all could be here. Um, I see we have a few people who are on with us, which is great. Um, really glad to see that. Um, glad you could be here. I know uh, it's a Monday, so you're getting back into the swing of things. If you're in the US, uh, coming back from a holiday weekend, which is always nice. So I hope your day is going well so far. Um, I am here in Vancouver, Canada. I'm originally from California, though. And um, the weather's been really nice here the last few days. It's been nice and warm, but uh, there's a lot of forest fires nearby. So there's been uh, some weird smoke in the air. Um, so like not great air quality, but I uh, can't complain since the weather is nice, which is great. So I want to say welcome to you all. Um, I'm really glad to be doing this Hangout. I know a lot of you have seen me do webinars before. Maybe you've attended one of mine in the past. Um, this is a bit of a different format, which I think is nice. Um, it's great to be able to do something where we can all see each other on video, which is always good. Um, I really want to encourage you to participate in the Hangout if you want. Um, send in your questions. Send in. Um, comments you may have about storytelling plus one to people's questions if you really want me to answer them. Um, I'm going to do my best to answer all the questions that come in today um, on storytelling, also fundraising in general. If you have questions on that too, happy to answer those. So there's a couple of reasons um, why I wanted to host this Hangout today. Um, first of all, I've never done one before, so I thought it would be a really great opportunity just to connect with everyone um, in a bit of a different form. And so if you are here, uh, you're welcome to use the chat box on the right-hand side of the Hangout screen to say hello and introduce yourself. Uh, but one of the reasons why I love doing these sorts of things is just that it's always a really great opportunity to connect with all of you um, in different ways to learn a little bit more about the work that you're doing um, and to also be able to help you with what I know, which brings me to the second reason why I'm uh, really excited to be here hang hosting this Hangout, um, which is that I love being able to share uh, what I'm learning with you all. Um, I do a lot of testing and a lot of work on storytelling and communications. And um, you know, I, I always think that the value of being able to do this kind of work is not in being able to hoard what I know myself, but being able to actually share it with other people um, so that your organizations can benefit from it. And um, you don't have to spend days or weeks on end banging your head against the wall trying to figure out what to do, as I did early on in my career. <laughs> so I was glad to help people avoid that. Um, and the last reason why I'm uh, really excited to be hosting this Hangout is that it's the first day of registration for a new class that I'm teaching called the Storytelling Nonprofit Masterclass. Um, so if you're interested in checking that out, you can go to the Storytelling Nonprofit Masterclass.com. Um, class starts on the let's see, 20th of this month, which would be great. It's a six week online class that I'm teaching on storytelling. But I don't want to spend too much time telling you about that because what I'm really here to do today is to answer your questions and to talk a little bit more about storytelling. So let me tell you a little bit about how um, I want to structure our hangout here today. Um, I'd like to talk briefly about four different areas of storytelling. So we're going to talk about the foundations of storytelling. Um, we'll talk about how to find stories. We'll talk about how to actually put a story together. So how do you take it from you know, those interview notes that you have to something that you can actually then use and send out to your donors? And the last area I want to talk about is um, how do you actually get those stories out in the world? So how do you make sure that people see them um, and that they're actually being read and being received well by your donors? Because that's always an important piece of the work, um, I think, anyways, is that uh, you know, we don't want to just do this work and then hope it all works out for the best, kind of keeping our fingers crossed. <laughs> it's nice to be able to have um, a greater reassurance that what we're doing is actually something that will work, that will resonate with our donors. And so I want to talk about that a little as well. So if you're just signing on to the Hangout, welcome, welcome. Um, I'd love for you to introduce yourself. You can use the chat function on the uh, right-hand side of the Hangout screen. Just pop your name in, tell us where you're calling in from. Maybe it's lunchtime where you are. Perhaps you're on the East Coast and it's near the end of the workday, in which case, lucky you. <laughs> so while folks are doing that, um, I'm going to go ahead and start a little bit in on um, the first section that I wanted to talk about, which is uh, a little bit about the foundations of storytelling. So I get a lot of questions from people about you know, where do we start? How do we even start telling stories? Um, and where do we really begin with this? Because it can seem like a bit of an overwhelming task, right? <laughs> There's 
a lot of the stories that we can tell, a lot of ways we can go about this. And so one of the things I like to recommend to people is to start with your mission statement which may seem, you know, a little basic, but I want to say that the reason why I recommend that is because your mission statement is the ultimate message. It's the reason why you do the work you do. It's the reason why your organization exists. It really tells the world about the type of impact your work is having. And that's really important because ultimately in stories, what we're really trying to do is we're trying to communicate the impact we're having and really give donors a very tangible sense of what that impact looks like when you know we have the money and the resources to be able to do the work that we want to do. So the reason why I recommend starting with your mission statement as kind of a, a core message or a key piece of the storytelling puzzle, so to speak, is that that can give you some good direction as to what stories to start telling. So if your mission statement is something to the extent of, you know, we help um, educate children in grades K through 12, for instance. Um, and that's a really broad mission statement, so <laughs> forgive me if that's a bad example. Um, but if that is, you know, your mission statement, let's just say, um, that can give you a good start as to indicating which stories you want to tell. You want to tell stories about kids who are in grades K through 12, preferably at your school. Um, you could also tell parents stories about those parents or stories about the teachers who are helping those kids. So if you take a look at your mission statement, that can really give you some kind of key indicators as to where, where you should be going with storytelling and also what types of stories um, you can be telling your donors. So I like to start there. And then what you can start to think about after that is, you know, once you are consistently communicating that message out into the world, what are some of the other supporting stories that you want to share? So you can think about what are some of the messages that you want to get out? So maybe um, you think about your mission statement as like the big message. So we'll just think about it as the big message that we have. Um, but then there are other supporting ones that we want to talk about. And maybe those are more targeted towards certain programs that we have or um, services that we offer, seasonal things we're doing, that kind of thing. Um, and those are really important too. So I, I like to kind of mind map it almost. <laughs> so creating kind of a big circle in the middle of the page that has the mission statement in it. And then kind of off of there having the spokes that are all of the supporting stories that we really want to get out into the world, um, which can be so important for our work, I think and a really big piece of that. Um, the other thing that I think is really essential, aside from kind of understanding the general messaging of your stories and communications, is being able to create a culture of storytelling. I often like to say to people that storytelling does not happen in a vacuum, and it's not going to happen just on your own merit. It really does require some degree of collaboration, and I think what I've seen a lot in the last year with some of the organizations I've worked with is that the ones who are really successful at storytelling are also the ones that have done an insanely good job of breaking down organizational silos. And by that, I mean they don't let things like, um, you know, departmental divides or internal politics get in the way from actually doing the work they want to be doing, which I realize is easier said than done. <laughs> so if you're sitting there thinking, yeah, that's a good suggestion, Vanessa. I'll get right on that. <laughs> um, I hear you. I have been at organizations like that before. I know how challenging that can be. Um, so what I want to encourage you to do there, if that's something that you feel like is a struggle for your organization, is to just think about you know, getting buy-in for storytelling. And by that, I mean being able to show other people the value that stories have for their work. And one of the good ways to do this um, is being able to say, you know, if we're able to tell stories about, you know, this program or service, we're able to raise more money so that you can continue to do the things that you're really passionate about. Um, and showing other staff members that, you know, storytelling has financial benefits for your organization, which means that they can continue to do this great work, maybe at a larger scale, maybe with more help, whatever that might look like. Although I would recommend not making promises you can't keep. But I think it is good to be able to give them a very tangible idea of how stories can really benefit them and what the larger impact is. Um, you know, I've worked with people before in research institutes um, who are doing kind of complicated, convoluted work <laughs> on, um, you know, science research, things like that. And um, that can seem really complicated and it can be hard to tell stories about it. And it can also, um, as an example, be difficult to get cooperation for telling stories. Uh, and you may have experienced this yourself with some of your staff members. And so um, what I always like to think about is that, you know, the the more we can remind those people um, and as we get buy-in for storytelling that 
you know, other people don't understand their work the way they do. And that's why we need to tell them smaller stories so that they can start to understand it. I think it makes it easier for them to really see that what they're doing is complicated and we need to kind of simplify it a little bit, not totally, but we need to find ways to simplify that for other people so that they can really understand that. Um, so I had a couple questions about kind of this area of foundations with storytelling um, that I want to get to, and I just jotted them down here quickly. So uh, one of them is uh, that somebody has um, is working with staff members who have a desire to protect client confidentiality, um, which is preventing them from really supporting storytelling. So she wants to know what she can do about this, which I think is a great question. I get asked about client confidentiality a lot. Um, because that is a big issue. I think whether or not you work with a, a sensitive or vulnerable population, it's always important to respect people's um, privacy and confidentiality when we're telling stories. So first, I always recommend talking one-on-one -on -one with the staff members who have these concerns about confidentiality, not to discredit them, but to simply understand why they have those concerns. Um, understand really what's at the root of it. So is it really about um, protecting client identity or is it about something else and really figuring out what that is um, I think is always always key and then what I would suggest doing is once you think about and find out what that reason is is start to see if you can brainstorm solutions with them so if they're really concerned about protecting people's identity you know can you use pseudonyms or change people's names um, can you use stock photos instead of real photos of your clients start to kind of creatively brainstorm ways around that. And I think that what's really beneficial is that when you can involve staff members in this process who have the concerns, they feel like they have more agency in the process and actually have a voice in what's happening, um, which is really, really key, I think. Um, when people feel like they've been a part of the process, um, I think they're more likely to be accepting of what's happening and also um, just generally happy to support um, what's going on. So a couple thoughts on that. Um, let's talk about finding stories. Um, this is another really important one, I think. Um, I think there's a couple ways we can think about finding stories. Uh, and I know that this is a big challenge for a lot of people um, when, we, when it comes to storytelling, because as fundraisers or maybe as a nonprofit communications professional, you know, you may not be out on the front lines collecting stories, doing the work. So it's hard to actually get those stories to then be able to go out into the world and tell them. So what I like to suggest doing is a couple of things. So if you're kind of struggling to figure out where you should find stories or how to go about doing this, um, first of all, define what stories you need. So go back to that concept we talked about a few minutes ago around um, being able to uh, think about your mission statement and those supporting stories and really concretely define what those key stories are that you're looking for. Because in my experience anyways, the more specific you can be with a staff member about the types of stories you're looking for, the more successful you'll be in being able to find them. Because if you go to somebody and say, you know, tell me a story, I'm looking, I need a story for a fundraising appeal. You know, that's a really broad request and they may not understand, you know, what kind of story you're looking for or how it's going to be used, whatever. It's it's really better to be specific in that process. So that's certainly something I recommend doing. Um, I always think it's good to collect stories on an ongoing basis, which I realize is also another challenge as well. Um, so one of the things I see happen a lot with um, some of the organizations I work with is that they will wait until they're about ready to write an appeal to find a story, or they'll wait until they have a big campaign going out until they're um, ready to kind of send out that story. So what I recommend people do is really focus on being able to collect those stories on a much more ongoing basis so that when you do have projects that you're ready to work on, you actually have stories already that you can use or you know where to go to get those stories. That can just make the whole process much easier and I think in general will make it easier for you to incorporate stories more often in some of the work that you're doing. Um, I, I think a couple ways to do this. Um, one, I like to recommend scheduling time to actually focus on storytelling. Uh, when I was a development officer a number of years ago, uh, one of the things I used to do was actually schedule recurring appointments on my calendar to do things like donor stewardship and focusing on um, writing stories for communications, things like that. So um, I think it was on like Tuesday mornings and Thursday afternoons, I had an hour blocked off of my calendar to focus on making donor thank you calls. And what's really good about just the simple thing of like booking recurring appointments with yourself in your calendar is that you'll actually get to that work. It means that other people can't book meetings with you 
and you actually have designated time to do that activity. And so I think the same can apply to storytelling. You may not need an hour every week, but maybe you need an hour every other week to interview people, to talk to people, whatever that might look like for you. And when you can actually get that on your calendar, make sure it's in there and make sure you're making the space for it, it's more likely to happen. Um, and as I said, re scheduling recurring appointments, I think, is also um, really helpful just to make sure that it's always there and uh, always happening. Um, I have people often ask me, you know, what should I do if I can't get program staff to share stories with me? <laughs> so maybe you've had this happen to you before, too, where you're like, I just need a story. <laughs> Why won't anyone share one with me? Um, there's a couple of things you can think about doing in this case. Um, if you are not doing program delivery work, uh, one of the things I like to recommend is that you actually volunteer at your organization. Um, I, one of the organizations I worked with early on in my career, we actually, as development staff, got two hours a month to volunteer anywhere in the organization that we wanted to on, um, like, during our workday. So we didn't have to volunteer outside of our work hours, but it was just part of what we could do if we wanted to experience the organization in new ways. And this was really great, and I think it's really brought home for me the fact that, like, the more integrated people are with the work, the better everyone's functioning. So if you feel like you don't have direct access to the stories, go volunteer. Go find where the stories are. So volunteer maybe once a month with one of the program activities, or if there's a big event coming up, volunteer with that. That's going to give you more direct access to the people who your organization is serving and ultimately um, easier access to the, some of the stories that you're really looking to share, which is also helpful. Um, the other thing you can also remember, too, is that it's not just about client stories. Client stories are great because they most directly demonstrate impact, but there's lots of other stories that you can share. You, can, you could share stories about donors, you could share stories about staff members, about your board members, um, about volunteers all sorts of other people. Um, and these people can all speak to impact, maybe not in the exact same way that a client can, um, but this is a great way to be able to, again, be demonstrating what your organization is doing in a very tangible way and uh, getting people involved in, an, in a pretty different way than maybe they have been in the past. So I'm gonna pause here because um, I do wanna take some questions um, in the event that uh, folks are interested in asking them. So um, if you'd like to send them in using the chat box function, um, you are more than welcome to do that. Um, I'm just gonna go double check that the settings are right on that quickly. Um, let's see. Yeah, okay, so let's see if anything has come in here. Not yet. Okay. No problem. So I can keep going <laughs> and uh, we'll keep going here um, just to talk a little bit more about stories. And of course, um, as I said, if you do have questions, um, would love to hear from you. So you can send those in um, using the chat box there. Um, you can, let's see, I don't know what else we can do besides that. Um, <laughs> that's probably the easiest way to send them to me. So let's keep going here. Um, I want to talk about actually creating the story. So this is kind of the third thing I mentioned we talked about. So we talked about the foundations of storytelling. We've talked about um, finding stories. And now I want to talk about actually creating it. So this is a big challenge I hear about from a lot of people um, who say, you know, I'm not a writer, I'm a fundraiser, I don't have the skills to be able to write a really prolific story. I hear you on that. I know writing is difficult. Um, and it's something I feel like I don't have a natural talent for. It's taken me years to get better at. <laughs> but from the work I've done, I can really tell you that it is possible to get better at writing. And not only that, I don't think you necessarily need to have a knack for writing in a very literary way to be a great writer. I think there's a lot of um, tips and things you can do in persuasive writing like fundraising appeals that will make it a lot easier and you don't need to focus so much on um, how eloquent something is phrased. Um, a lot of it's really just about, um, a lot of really good copywriting um, really comes from um, a lot of principles on psychology, um, which is pretty fascinating to me. So, you know, you think about um, advertising or some direct mail letters that you may have received recently. And um, a lot of what you'll see in those is, um, you know, bold headlines, clear calls to action. All of those things are very straightforward. And there's a reason why we do those um, in fundraising appeals and in stories is because they work. They call people's attention to someplace very specific and they get them ready to take action, which is key. 
So I think that's um, one of the good things that you can certainly think about. Um, there's lots of really great books on copywriting and um, consumer psychology, which I think totally applies to fundraising, although we don't always think it does. Uh, but there's, uh, I think, just a really good place to start learning more about um, persuasive writing. Um, one book that I really like a lot that uh, I'm looking at on my bookshelf over there <laughs> is uh, called The Art of Explanation by Lee Lefebvre. Um, really wonderful book on how to actually explain things to people. Um, so he talks a lot about how you can explain more complicated concepts to an audience who has a different perspective or knowledge base or opinion than you do, and how to gently gently take them from point A to point B um, in their understanding, which is really important. Um, so that's a really good book to check out. I would also recommend that as well. Um, the other thing I like to recommend that people do, and I, I feel like maybe I've just taken this for granted over the year, <laughs> years, is um, if you feel like you have a really hard time writing, like if you sit down at the computer or maybe you pull out a notepad and you're just like, I don't know what to write, and you feel like you're really suffering from writer's block. Um, one of the things that I recommend doing, especially if you feel like you're a really strong verbal communicator, is to get out your smartphone or a digital tape recorder of some kind, but most smartphones have a recording function on them, and actually just record yourself talking out loud. So record the appeal that you want to say um, or the story that you want to share, whatever that is. Just record it vo uh, verbally rather than writing it down. And I find that what happens for a lot of people is that when they focus on just talking out loud and um, just saying it rather than having to actually like write, um, it's much easier for them to actually get what's in their head out into the world. And when you have it recorded, you can then transcribe it. So then all you need to do is focus on editing it and refining it. And one of the really good things about this actually is that when you do that, you'll actually capture the natural tone and cadence of your voice a lot better than you would if you were just sitting down to write because a lot of times we self-censor or we feel like we have to phrase things differently than we would usually say them, um, which really takes away from that natural kind of very human um, tone and how we speak and how we write. Um, and I think that's how a lot of people end up sounding kind of I guess what we would say is more like corporate speak in, how, in, um, in the writing and in their appeals. So that's one thing that I would suggest if you do struggle with that. Um, it's a pretty easy thing you can try out, um, see if it works for you. The other thing I always like to tell people is to focus on one emotion. Um, so when you, before you start writing the story um, and you think about the call to action and the messaging that's going in there, I also like to jot down what is the emotion that I want people to feel. So I like to think about um, three things when I write. So what do I want people to think? What do I want people to feel? And what do I want them to do? So think, feel, do. And I think about my story or that fundraising appeal as moving people on a journey from thinking to feeling to doing. And that's really important. And I've read a lot about um, kind of this process of moving from thinking to feeling as really being the place where we shift readers from their um, logical brain into their emotional brain, which is super important because that's where they're more likely to take action. They, they empathize, which is really important. They also feel something for the person whom they're reading about. So I like to think about that structure a little bit. Um, so I'll just repeat it again in case um, you didn't catch it. So what do I want people to think? What do I want people to feel? And what do I want people to do? And that last one's pretty obvious for us in fundraising. That's our call to action. Um, but those other two are really important. We often think about what we want people to think when they read a fundraising appeal, like, oh, this is really bad, or maybe this problem needs to be solved. But it's also really important to think about what you want them to feel. So what emotion are you really trying to evoke in them? Are you wanting them to feel sad about something? Do you want them to feel inspired to take action? So the feeling would be feeling inspired. Um, do you want them to feel... Um, like they have a positive outlook on the world, things like that, <laughs> all those sorts of things. There's a million different emotions they could feel. Um, but it's just really important to pick one and think about what that one is very intentionally in your writing process because the more you can tap into that, the more likely you are to be successful in getting people to feel that emotion. Um, you'll choose your sentences differently. You'll probably also think about um, how you're structuring things a little bit differently as well because if you know that you want people to feel happy instead of feeling sad, you're more likely to use a positive tone, for instance. You're more likely to talk about things in a optimistic way, things like that. 
they're little small changes, but I find that a lot of those can really add up to um, an appeal that has a lot of personality um, and a story also that has a lot of personality as well, which is always a good thing. Um, let's see, so let's go ahead and get to the last section on this, which is um, sharing stories, uh, which is a, a big thing, right? Um, this is this is the big problem, I think, for a lot of us, is that uh, we spend a lot of time writing appeals, writing stories, scheduling social media posts, and then the big question is, how do we get people to see these? So how do we make sure that our audience actually sees our stories? So a couple of things I wanna offer you on this topic, um, which is a big topic, <laughs> um, is first, know your audience and share your stories on the channels that your audience is actually using. This is probably the number one thing I see people do wrong when it comes to actually externally communicating with their nonprofit audience or even just their donor audience in general, um, is that you know we feel like we have to be on every single social media channel and that we feel like we need to be doing it all, but we're not really focusing enough on um, what exactly um, our audience is responding to, which is so, so important. So I would really encourage you to take the opportunity to look at what's happening on your social media channels um, and not just social media some of the other channels you might use like email or direct mail um, things like that really start to look at some of your metrics what's working and what is not working um, and really think about what you can start to do to um, encourage more participation or get people using it more or really think about also um, and this is probably the more important thing is which of those channels are you getting the most interaction on now and which can you really leverage? So if you find, for instance, that um, your Facebook page is really popular, but you find there's just tumbleweeds over on Twitter, nobody's retweeting things, nobody's responding to things, that most likely means that your audience is not active on Twitter, and that's okay. It's probably better for you to step away and focus more on using Facebook and really honing in your marketing strategy there. Um, that's a really important thing to think about. Um, I think, anyways, uh, in terms of how we're communicating, is you know making sure that we're talking to people in the right place, um, not just telling them the right message at the right time, but really the right place. Um, so making sure that that channel is um, what we want to be doing. Um, the second thing I would suggest is make sure that you're being consistent. I see this happen a lot with people where they get really gung-ho about um, storytelling or maybe something else, and um, they're really on the ball for maybe like a week or two, and then they just kind of lose the wind from their sales, and I get it. Um, life gets busy, um, you know, work gets busy, things come up, and it can be challenging sometimes for us to um, really stick to that initial schedule that we laid out for ourselves. So I would encourage you to think about how can you bring more consistency into your storytelling work? Um, and maybe that means just committing to um, consistently sharing on social media once a week rather than attempting to do five times a week because you know you can't do that. Whatever that looks like for you. Um, think about your capacity and um, what you're really able to get done there. And the last thing I would suggest to you in terms of um, being able to share your stories with better results is test. Test everything. <laughs> um, I heard this advice from a friend of mine uh, who works at Upworthy years ago who said that the basis of all of their work is testing and I believe it. Um, and I know that from my own work as well um, with fundraising is that the more that I've tested things, the more successful I've um, been able to be because I've been able to see what's working, what's not working, and then continuing to refine what is working. Um, I find this is easiest done through email. Sometimes you can test things on social media as well, but email really offers you a lot because you're able to see open rates, um, click-through rates, you're able to do testing of subject lines, all those sorts of things. Um, whereas with direct mail, it can be a little bit more of a long drawn out process where you're only testing one variable at a time and it can take you a long time to get through a good amount of testing. Um, email can be done much more quickly. So if you do have an active email program, that can be a really great place to start with some testing. Um, and as you do figure out what's working for your audience and um, figure out what's happening, um, I'd really encourage you to start to make some notes about that. So um, create some sort of like centralized knowledge document um, for your organization about your audience, about what you've tested, what you've found, um, kind of like a scientific experiment journal, so to speak. <laughs> um, but just uh, really keeping track of those comments and those thoughts um, so that you are able to um, share that knowledge with more people um, and really keep it as um, institutionalized knowledge for your organization, which is uh, so important in the process. 
Um, great. So a couple questions I had from people about sharing stories. So first question is, how do we get people to discover, read, and engage with our content? Um, so I'll go back to what I said about understanding and knowing your audience. Go where the people are. <laughs> so think about where your current audience is. Um, and if that's different than your actual donor audience, think about where your donor audience hangs out or ask them where they hang out. Um, try to figure out where they're spending their time and where you're most likely to meet them in a very natural place for them. Um, so maybe they're using a channel that you haven't considered using before. That's okay. You might want to try it, um, see if it works a little bit better for you. Um, in terms of getting people to engage, I think you have to really lead by example. So you as an organization also have to be um, conversational and engaging. It can't just be kind of this one-way megaphone of communication where you're constantly just getting information out into the world about your organization and the work that you're doing, but you have to invite conversation back towards you. So things like asking questions, responding to other people's posts, simple things like that can um, really invite people to be engaged much more than they currently are with your content. So that's a simple thing you can do. It might just even be something as small as taking 20 minutes a day to respond to some different posts um, and people who are engaged with your organization or maybe who you want to be engaged. You can do things like that. So some simple tips there for you. So we've talked about four different areas. We talked about um, foundations of stories. We've talked about um, how to find stories. We talked about um, crafting the story, so how to actually write it and get it out into the world. Um, and then we finally kind of wrapped up here just a minute ago with um, talking about um, how to actually share our stories. So how do we get them out in front of people, which is certainly a big key as well. Um, so I hope some of these tips were helpful for you. Um, I know we've covered some pretty big topics uh, just on the surface, and there's, of course, lots more to share about all of those. Um, if you are interested in learning more about any of those, um, I'll be sharing a lot more in a webinar on Thursday um, that I'm teaching via July 9th at 11 a.m. Pacific. Um, the best place to go to uh, learn a little bit more about that webinar is uh, learn to tell nonprofit stories.com. Um, I'm also teaching a new online class as well that starts later this month called the Storytelling Nonprofit Masterclass. So if you are interested in learning a little bit more about um, storytelling and some of these areas um, to be able to tell compelling stories that really help your organization raise money, I'd encourage you to check that out as well. So we have a few minutes here, and I would uh, love to answer some questions for folks. Um, so let's see if we can do that. So what I'd encourage you to do is um, go ahead and send in your questions through the um, group chat box. So if you um, are in the Google Hangout function, over on the left-hand side of your screen, you'll see a little blue chat box uh, or blue icon that looks like a chat box. If you scroll over that and click that, um, the group chat pop up. Um, that is the best place to type in your questions. So I'll give everyone maybe a minute or so here to do that. I um, am just going to grab some water. Let's see. So as I said, I am happy to answer questions about um, storytelling, about fundraising, anything that's top of mind for you right now, um, projects you're working on this summer as well. I know a lot of people like to get a head start on um, year-end appeals during the summertime, uh, which is always a good idea. It's also a good time for donor stewardship too, if you haven't thought about that. Um, leading into year-end fundraising where we're really going to start ramping up communications and also asks with our donors. This is a great time to focus on stewardship. Um, just good cultivation communication with your donors, thanking them, talking to them, informing them, things like that. Um, Non-asks are really good this time of year. Great, so I have a couple of questions here uh, that I'll go ahead and answer. Um, good question from uh, Sarah who wants to know, how much detail should I go into when I share a story? I know the sh story shouldn't be too long and have too many details, but how much is too much? How long um, is too long until I know where I might lose the reader? Um, I don't wanna bore them, but I also wanna know how to best grab their attention. So really good question. <laughs> um, this is one of those key things that I think a lot of people wish there was kind of like a magic answer to of like this is exactly how long the story needs to be. Um, but unfortunately, I don't think there is. Um, I, I think my first answer would be that you should test things. As I said earlier, that's 
certainly the best way to figure out um, where people's attention is dropping off. Um, the other thing I would also say is that it depends on your audience and the channel that you're staring that story on. So a story in direct mail will likely be pretty different from a story that you share in a 140 character tweet, for instance. So really think about what some of those key differences are um, and what might, um, and how those might influence your storytelling. So for instance, if you know you have you know, 500 words in an email, um, you will probably choose, a, choose your words a lot more wisely than if you have you know, 1,000 words on your web page, for instance, to tell your story. So really think about the medium or the channel that you're using for storytelling, and think about how that can influence your story itself. Um, oftentimes, that will give you kind of some parameters to work within. Um, for better or worse, I actually think um, having some of those creative limitations can actually make us more creative in the work we do. Um, and I like to encourage them because I think sometimes when we just are um, given projects where there's kind of no parameters or no guidelines, it can be really overwhelming to work on. Um, so if you restrict yourself or give yourself some general guidelines, even if you know that they're not absolutely necessary, um, I can really help you to be a little bit more creative in thinking about the work that you're doing. Great, so any other questions? I hope you guys have been enjoying this. Uh, first time I've done a Google Hangout, actually, so uh, my apologies, as I said, for the uh, technical issue at the beginning. Um, but I hope this has been good for everyone, just to talk a little bit about storytelling, um, get some of your questions answered. Um, and if you do have any more questions, we have a couple more minutes here, I'd be happy to answer them, so you can send them in through the uh, chat box on the Hangouts page. You can also, um, if you're watching, there we go, great. So if you're watching on the main Hangouts page, you can also um, type in a comment there. Great, so I see a question that came in, which is awesome, from Stacy. Um, she wants to know, what are some good questions to ask when collecting stories? Any good general questions you can share? Yeah, I love that question. <laughs> um, that's a really good one. I um, think it takes a long time sometimes to kind of hone what questions you want to ask people in interviews to really get to the key information that you're looking for. Um, so one of the questions I like to ask people is, how did it feel when? Um, and you can complete the sentence there with whatever works best for your organization and the context that you're working in. Um, I like to ask that question because sometimes we focus very much on the chronological facts of a story. So um, this happened, then this happened, and then this happened, and now this person is really great, or now here's the outcome. <laughs> so we take people through a really linear process in the story, which is fine. That's, that's how we tell a story oftentimes, is beginning, middle, and end. But what I think is really good is to be able to tap into some of the emotion along the way. So when somebody tells you about the problem they were having. So let's say they wanted to go to university, but they were having financial hardships, and so they didn't think they'd have the money to be able to go. A great question to ask there would be, how did it feel when you realized that you may not be able to go because you didn't have the money? Or you could also ask them, how did it feel when you found out you got a scholarship to go to the university? You can ask questions like that, that both kind of um, in different in different ways um, and in different scenarios to both extract the positive and the, and the negative emotions somebody might have been feeling in that situation. Um, so that's a question I really like to ask. Um, let's see. Another good question that I think is really interesting to ask, especially if somebody has been um, going through a process, a personal process or personal transformation, whatever that might be, um, or working on a project for a long period of time, is to ask themselves, five years ago, where did you think you would be with this? Or two years ago, where did you think you would be with this? And really see if they can tap into some of their nostalgia about the project, um, thinking about where they've been, what they might want to accomplish, things like that um, can be really helpful um, to ask. I also, um, one of the things that I like to do before I interview people for stories is actually talk to people who know that person. Um, to get a little more sense about their backstory, to learn more about who they are as an individual. Um, because what can happen oftentimes is when you go to an interview um, with no context for who you're actually talking to, um, you can really miss the key questions to ask. You may not know something about them, um, but when you do know it, you can ask a question about it. And they may not be as forthcoming or conversational or extroverted as you might be. So that can be a challenge sometimes with interviews. Um, so doing a little research ahead of time to ask people, you know, um, what do you know about this person? Um, what has their journey been like? What sort of changes have they gone through? All those sorts of questions you might normally ask um, can be really helpful um, for you to be able to ask better questions. 
Great. So I see a couple other questions here. Yay, one from Kristen. Um, so Kristen's question is, I'm currently writing lapsed donor emails for client. Um, they're fairly story, he story heavy, but I'm second guessing the story um, to organization information ratio. The client isn't asking for money. They just want to know if the donor would like to remain on their list. Um, a first for any lapsed donor, donor communication I've ever written. Do I lead with a story or do I lead with organizational info as a refresher? That's a really interesting question, Kristen. I can't say I've ever seen that before either, <laughs> the lapse donor um, engagement piece. Uh, but kind of interesting, and I'd be curious to know how that turns out for that organization. Um, I always like to lead with something more conversational, although I would say that if it is in an email, um, which I think you said it is, yeah, so it's in an email, emails um, are generally skim read much more than a direct mail letter will be, and if somebody's reading it on their mobile device especially, um, depending on what your mobile to desktop ratio might be, um, you might find that people um, are using their mobile devices, and that means that there's um, it's harder for them to read a long letter or a long email. So what's really important about an email structure is to get to the point quickly and then reiterate the point at the very end when people may have scrolled all the way through. So I always like to have some sort of call to action in the first sentence or two um, before the fold or before people have to scroll down at all. And then also at the very bottom in the PS, um, in case you have any kind of fast speed readers who've just skipped over the email and gone to the very bottom. Um, so that's where you can kind of hit people um, with those calls to action. What I would say is that once you immediately roll into the call to action, you can kind of say, um, you know, we want to know if you are interested in staying on our mailing list. Um, you've been a longtime supporter of ours or have helped us do X, Y, or Z, whatever that might be. Um, and then go into talking a little bit more about that or say, you know, since we last talked to you, here's a few of the things that have been happening with us and say, you know, we're really excited to share more about this. We hope you'll consider staying on our mailing list, things like that. Um, so I would probably um, lead with the calls to action and then include some of the story or the organizational information kind of sandwiched in the middle there. Yeah, so I hope that's helpful, Kristen. It's a really interesting appeal. Um, definitely never heard of anything like that before. Yeah. Great, so a couple minutes left here. Um, if anyone else wants to ask a question, please feel free to send it in. Be happy to answer it for you. I hope this has been helpful for everyone. I know we've kind of talked about some different aspects of storytelling, um, and I would love to do some more Google Hangouts like this with you all again. So if you are interested in doing this again, let me know. Um, and let me know if there are specific topics you want to talk about, um, maybe problems you're having, uh, questions you have about some aspect of storytelling. I feel like we could probably do an entire Hangout just on um, how to interview people and uh, what types of questions to ask when you're trying to get a story. That would also be a good one. Um, we could also probably do an entire Hangout on uh, storytelling and email, because email is kind of a particular, particularly interesting medium, I think, for fundraising and storytelling. Yeah. Great, well, we'll go ahead and end a few minutes early, um, especially for those of you who are on your lunch hour right now, I'll give you a few minutes to do a few things before you get back to work. So I just wanna say thank you everyone so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Um, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you all and um, to help you out with answering some of these questions. Um, as I mentioned, I am teaching a brand new class on storytelling at the end of the month. Um, the best way to find out more information about it is to go to the storytelling nonprofit masterclasscom um, You'll find out more information about the class there, things I'll be teaching as well as uh, class start date, which is on uh, July 20th. So coming up here pretty soon. All right, everyone. I hope you have a great rest of the day and a fabulous week ahead. Take care and thanks so much for hanging out with me today.